Okay, so welcome back. In part one of this um, series, we looked at this uh, battery pack here. It's basically a 10 amp hour USB battery pack. And I wanted to use it for a very quick and easy 5 volt bench supply because it has good capability. Again, it's 10 ampere hours, 5 volts. Um, so um, I wanted to just be able to plug in and get 5 volts out of it. One of the issues with this particular device is that it has internal circuitry that senses how much current is being drawn by these USB outputs. And if it's not enough, it decides, well, hey, wait, this isn't enough, I'm going to shut down. So what we did is we developed a um, circuit using a 555 timer that pulses the output of this every, say, 15 seconds and gives a uh, five second pulse of load to fake it into thinking there's sufficient load connected. So um, what I did is I came up with this little device here. You can see it's got an LED that goes on whenever it's turned on and drawing power from this. And it's got two 5 volt DC outputs and a USB input. So um, this is off now. So if I plug it in, you can see immediately that this light comes on, which means it's drawing power. These lights come on, which means it is providing power. And it shuts off for maybe 15 seconds, and this stays on. So while this is off, it's timing out, and it's going to come on for another 5 seconds. And fake this. There you go. You've got 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, almost 6 seconds. And it's going to keep doing that every 15 seconds or so and fake this out. So now we've got our constant 5 volt DC supply. We can just wire up to these terminals. Now, let's take a look inside and see what I did. So here is the inside. You can see I basically had a PCB made and I had some components lying around I just threw in there. But what we're going to look at is making a PCB like this, or, or having a supplier make this for us. And if you haven't done this before, I strongly recommend that you think about it at least, because what seems like a really difficult and challenging um, issue is really um, surprisingly straightforward, inexpensive, and you can get... Um, Usually I get, after I send the uh, information to the manufacturer, I can get a board here in the U.S. within about a week. And, you know, you we're talking, you can get like five of these for maybe a total of $25, including shipping and everything else. So it's really very uh, nice thing to be able to do if you want to just throw together a little uh, circuit like this. And um, you get it very quick and it's very inexpensive. So in this video, we're going to talk about some of the conceptual things that you need to consider in how to make a PCB, how to get the data needed for the manufacturer to make it. And instead of a, you know, go step by step, like you normally say, do this, do this, do this, uh, we're going to look at why you need to do it. And so you get a better understanding of What's the reasons why we're doing these different steps? So then when you have to do the steps, it becomes a little bit more intuitive and easy to understand. Okay, so here is the 555 timer circuit we developed in the previous video. And over here is our 5 volt to 10 ampere hour battery. It's a DC source. And um, on the output, we've got this uh, MOSFET and it is being gated by this 555 timer with a square wave pulse. And when it turns on, it applies a 22 ohm resistor across this five volt battery to draw current from the battery to keep it on, to fake it out, to make it think that there's enough current here. And I went through the, the workings of this in the previous video. I encourage you to take a look. Um, basically, it's an RC circuit that charges up this capacitor and um, as the capacitor charges, when it gets up to a certain value, it affects the trigger and threshold, and that turns on the output, 
And when it discharges, it turns it off. Therefore, the, the charging and discharging times affect the duty cycle of the output. And again, you can look at the previous video to get details. Okay, and here I've taken my pulsar circuit and um, I'm measuring two values. I'm measuring the voltage across the capacitor, and that's in blue. And I'm also measuring the voltage across the output resistor, which indicates current flowing um, to pulse the, um, the battery. And that's in yellow. And you can see it pulses on. I'm in roll mode here because it's a slow process. And I'm on for five seconds and off for about 15. So um, again, here's LT Spice. And what we're going to do is we are going to develop this printed circuit board. And I've got the front here and I've got the back. Basically, you just flip this over and here's what you see on the back. And um, we're going to start thinking about what we need to convert this uh, electrical simulation into a printed circuit board. The first thing you know, you're going to have to decide how big the board is, right? You're going to have to decide, uh, do you need a one foot by one foot board or do you need a one inch by one inch board? You're going to have to tell the manufacturer how big the board is, okay? And to do that, you're going to have to figure out the physical dimensions of each of these components. In LT Spice, there's no data whatsoever to tell you how big this resistor is or how big this integrated circuit is. But if you're going to make a printed circuit board, if you look at it, well, the thing you need to know is where is each component located and where do I drill the holes, okay? Here is in the um, 555 timer over here is right here, and you can see it's eight pins. And I'm going to need the physical dimensions of each of those pins so I can tell the manufacturer, okay, drill a hole here, drill a hole here, drill a hole here, and so on. And I'm going to have to do that. I'm going to have to get the physical arrangement of each component. How big is it? So I know where to drill the holes and where to place the holes. When you think about it, does the printed circuit board care if this is a 22 ohm resistor or a 1K resistor? No, basically it couldn't care less about any of the electrical characteristics. It just needs to know where do I drill the holes. Now, what else does it need to know? Well, it needs to get data from this circuit showing what uh, terminals of each device get connected. So, for example, this R6 is going to get connected to the uh, source of the MOSFET. All right, so here's R6. So I'm going to need to connect that to this MOSFET. All right, so um, it needs data on the physical configuration of each component, the dimensions, the location, and also, for each pin of that device, what do I connect it to? So, um, this is the front or top of the board, and this is the other side of the board. Basically, this is this board flipped over. And what I've done is I have flipped this so that they are in line. So, for example, if you're looking at this board from the top, I've flipped this bottom image so that it matches. So, for example, uh, this R1 right here is this terminal here, and this terminal of R1 is this one here. In the real world, it would be flipped, but just so you can uh, see the alignment of these. So, we know that R1, R5, and R2, these terminals are all connected together. So, where do we see that in the... Um, in the diagram, well, here's R2, R5, and R1, and their terminals are all connected together right here. So that makes sense. But you'll notice that those connections are on the other side of the board from this. Now, there are different methods that we can use to connect the terminals together. Why would we want to use these different methods? Well, if we look at this um, circuit, you can see that the wires coming out and going into this IC cross in different places, okay? So 
it can be a bit of a challenge to arrange your components on the board so that you don't get crossing uh, wires. For example, if you have all these wires coming out, then you know if, you, if this uh, terminal has to get connected to here, you're going to have to somehow con run it through this wire. So um, you're going to have to figure out a way to make it so that none of these wires cross when you don't want them to. What you can do is you can use the top or front and back or bottom of the board to make your connections. So in this case, I've used the top and bottom of the board to make separate connections. All right, It makes life a little bit easier. So I can just, uh, for example, this pin 2 on the integrated circuit to the capacitor, but this pin um, 3 is going to go over to the MOSFET, make a connection to the MOSFET so it doesn't cut through this here. Now, you may notice the different colors here. Um, here, you've got a darker kind of green, and here you've got lighter. And you can see that these connecting wires are lighter, and the non-connecting board itself, this is like a fiberglass board, is darker. And the same case is here on the back. The darker means just non-conductive fiberglass board, and the lighter is actual copper wire connectors uh, between the points. But you can see here that most of this back is the lighter uh, color, which means all of this light color is copper. It's, it's connecting conductive copper. So um, one of the benefits of doing this is you can make an entire um, board, top or bottom, as, for example, a ground plane, a conductive ground plane, and it makes it so much easier. Uh, for example, in our case, we've got one, two, three, four, five components that all need to connect to ground. If you make this entire bottom as a conductive ground, copper ground plane, then what you can do is like you see down here. We'll zoom in a bit. And you can see that this right here is the capacitor, and it is connected directly to this ground plane, while these others are isolated from the ground plane, and they're just connected together. So you can do some cool stuff. You can say, you know, I can identify these certain uh, connectors as ground uh, connectors, and for example, up here, I can do the same thing. And this big resistor connects to ground. And you can see you've got these like pinwheels here that connect it to the ground plane. And these others aren't connected. They've got these isolated tracks that are separated from the ground. So uh, again, you can use the top or front and back or bottom to connect between. And you can also use these as either positive 5 volts in this case, or ground, and you can run separate con connectors or conductors um, inside that ground plane. So your life is a lot easier. You don't have to worry about crossing wires. So what we're going to do uh, is we're going to take this circuit, and we're going to use a free piece of software called KiCad which is a um, computer-aided design. That's what CAD means. It's a free CAD program that will allow us to convert this into the information that your um, manufacturer is going to need to give you these boards. So again, what, what they need to know is where are the components, what are the dimensions, and where do I drill the holes, and where do I make the traces? Now, one other thing you may have noticed is that this trace here is thicker than these other traces. So why would that be? Well, if you're going to be carrying current, just as you, know, you need a bigger AWG wire to carry big currents, you need a bigger copper trace to carry big currents. So we're going to talk about the requirements for traces, but you can right away see that this is coming from the 5-volt supply, 
and I've made this thicker because presumably it will carry more current than these other logic traces or low-level traces, okay? Okay, so given all of that, let's start thinking about what um, we're going to need to do in this other piece of software called KeyCAD in order to provide all the data from this circuit to the manufacturer of the PCB. Well, we said uh, a big part of it is going to be which components are connected to which pins of other components. So we're going to have to duplicate this circuit diagram in KeyCAD, right? It, we've got to tell um, the board manufacturer which pins of which components to connect together. So we're going to have to pretty much duplicate all of these connections in KeyCAD. Again, we don't care about the electrical um, properties of these components. It is pretty much irrelevant. It's the connections and the physical footprints or arrangement of each component. So we're going to look here in, this is KeyCAD, and what I've done is I have basically reproduced the LT Spice uh, circuit diagram in KeyCAD as what's called a schematic, all right? And you can see I've got my 555, I've got the resistors and the diodes and the big capacitor, and I've got a, I've added a connector, and I've added my output MOSFET and resistors, okay? So you've got to have this information to tell KeyCAD and the manufacturer which pins of which components are connected together, all right? So what else do we need? Well, we said we have to have the physical dimensions of each component, i.e. the footprint. So the next thing we're going to have to do is figure out for this IRF MOSFET, what footprint do I need to give to the manufacturer to say here's where the pins are located and here's, the, here's where you drill the holes. Well, luckily, KeyCAD has some wonderful libraries of pre-made um, footprints. For example, this 555 timer, it's got a pre-made um, uh, 555 footprint, just like LT Spice has pre-made components. You can just drag and drop a timer, a 555 timer footprint, and you can use it to um, develop your board layout. So now the next thing we need to do is we need to, for some of these components, we're going to have to figure out what are the physical dimensions of this particular capacitor. For example, this capacitor is a lot larger, it's a thousand microfarads, than this one. And the one I'm using, this is a much bigger, physically bigger capacitor than the small one. So I'm going to have to figure out the physical dimensions of this capacitor and the physical dimensions of this so I can choose the right capacitor footprint from the library. So you may have to get out your ruler and your capacitor and figure out um, what the dimensions are. Again, once you've got that, it's easy. You just drag and drop the component. Same thing with the resistors. If you're using a big 2 or 10 watt resistor, the physicals are going to be a lot larger than if you're using a very small resistor. Now what do you need to do? So we've got the, we know what, what the connections need to be, all right? We know what these are. We know what the physical footprint of each component is. Well, what's next? Well, if you think about it, we need to arrange each component on the board to figure out where to drill the holes. We know what the dimensions are, but where are we going to drill them? We've got the connections, we've got the physical arrangement, we need to know where to drill them, and we also need to know um, what layer to run our traces on, either the front or the back, top, bottom, or both. Um, we, we're going to have to do the details of that. And to do that, you will go into the next um, button, which is generate netlist. Now, what is a netlist? Well, if you think about it, you've got all this information that you've generated in the schematic. You've got the connections, you've got the footprints assigned, and that is basically has generated a .sch or schematic file. And the schematic file is basically just a text file that has all the important data in this. Now, we're going to need to arrange 
these components in a different module of the software of KiCad, but we need to transfer this data into this next module where we can lay out and arrange these components, and that's called a netlist. And again, a netlist is just a, a text file that includes all of the footprint data and the connection data. Again, it's a very simple text file. And uh, if you look at if you look at our um, project files, we now have a PCB file, which we'll go into next. We've got the netlist, which is this file right here, which I was just talking about. We've got the schematic, and then we've got a cache. So you start out with the schematic, then you generate a netlist, which is extracts all the important information from the schematic so we can feed it into the PCB software where we lay out the components. So to do that, we've got the netlist, we will generate the netlist, and then we go into this PCB new. And this is a um, module of the software where we lay it out. So I'll click on that, and <clears throat> what I've done is I have already laid out this um, board. And one of the nice things here is I can view 3D Viewer I can view a 3D view of each component and I can get a physical picture of, yeah, um, that makes sense. I've got a big resistor here. I've got a MOSFET, some smaller wattage resistors. Okay, now that we have a good general overview of the processes and the concepts we need in order to generate our own uh, PCBs in KiCad, in the next video what we're going to do is we're going to go into a little bit more depth and actually go through some of these processes and, and show you how to do it from scratch. So hope that helps. Take care and have a really good day. Thanks.